me start by asking you a simple question. Do you think exercise is good for you? Of course you do. There's a whole raft of scientific evidence that tells us that appropriate exercise has a positive impact on our health in many ways. There's a whole industry of gyms, DVDs, articles, TV shows and books that introduce us to the world of personal trainers, sports scientists and health promotion workers. So we know that exercise is something we should all be doing if we're able. Yet, within this regular bombardment, there's very little insight into how and why changes occur during regular physical activity. How much do we really know about the physiological magic that occurs within our bodies as we seek that holy grail that is fitness? Now, my name's Dean Hodgkin. I've spent over 25 years traveling around the world to educate industry professionals and the man and woman in the street about a practical understanding of anatomy and physiology. My aim has been to teach not just the hows, but more importantly, the whys of fitness. This course is designed to equip you with the basic understanding of how your body works and how it responds to certain stimuli. My aim is to enable you to set and meet your own health and fitness goals, be that permanent weight loss, uh, completing a charity run, or, or just simply having more energy to live your day-to-day -day life with gusto. Now, studies have shown us that about 60% of adults don't get enough exercise and 25% don't get any exercise at all. The recommended guidelines are 150 minutes a week, and if you double that, you reduce your risk of coronary heart disease by 20%. But a 2011 study in Taiwan of more than 400,000 adults proved that people who exercised an average of 92 minutes a week, now that's just 15 minutes a day, six days, were about 14% less likely to die for any reason while in the study. And that's not all. In this particular research, every 15 minutes more of exercise each day reduce the chance of dying from any cause by another 4% and specifically by cancer, uh, from cancer by 1%. So just think about this. You could extend your life, reduce your risk of heart disease, diabetes and cancer just by getting in 15 minutes or more of exercise each day. Now, surely that's something within reach of most of you watching this right now. Yet many people don't get those 15 minutes or more even though it's clearly so beneficial. Well, why not? Lack of time, lack of energy, lack of motivation, lack of information. These are just four of the most common reasons. This course is designed to help you tackle and overcome these obstacles. We'll look for ways to fit exercise into your daily life and really understand what it's doing for you so you'll feel more motivated to make a habit of it. I'm going to give you some tips uh, on how to squeeze exercise into your day, whether you're at work um, or even in the car. Um, here at the great courses, for instance, uh, folks run up the stairs in their day, in between meetings, on their way to meetings. There's a hula hoop group uh, that meets in breaks, and the company sponsors things like walking teams and 30 minute a day fitness challenges, and those are big things you can try, but I'll also show you how to squeeze a little workout uh, in at your desk, at the photocopier, while you're on the phone. Our journey through many aspects of health and fitness will teach you how your body is structured and how it functions. We'll demonstrate principles with practical examples based on sound, thoroughly researched fact rather than fad or fashion. Along the way, we'll be bringing in subject matter experts from uh, other great courses to talk to us about the latest research in a number of areas related to physiology and fitness. We'll be talking to Professor Stephen Novella about some myths of fitness and the most important aspects of fitness as we age. We'll get insights into the impact of stress on your body and how to use exercise to counter those effects with Professor Robert Sapolsky. Professor Craig Heller will talk with us about some of his fascinating experiments on exercise physiology and the role of sleep and rest in recovery. And we'll hear from Professor Jason Satterfield, whose clinical research delves into the relationship between physical exercise and a healthy mind. We'll consider common health issues that occur through various stages of life so that even though some might not relate to you directly at this moment in time, you could become a vital conduit, the translator for your family and friends around you who may be facing their own specific challenges and opportunities. 
If you consider my uh, uh, writing career, nearly 20 years in mainstream uh, consumer magazines, as well as direct contact, um, I've literally taught millions of people how to improve their fitness over the years. And I've realized that there's a split between how people view fitness. Firstly, there's a group who exercise regularly, even fanatically, but don't necessarily understand the science of physiology. What's really going on inside your body as you work out? And how do you apply that knowledge to improve the quality of a workout? And then there's another group. This group reads or watches a, a lot of the science of physiology. They, they know what impact weightlifting has on bone structure or how raising your heart rate regularly can strengthen the heart. But they don't necessarily apply that knowledge to consistent workouts. In other words, rarely are the two aspects of physiology interwoven so that scientific knowledge can improve the exercise or so that exercise can improve understanding of physiology. And that's what I aim to do in this series. I'm convinced that you need both knowledge and practice to create a successful and consistent program of exercise for the rest of your life. For this reason, throughout the lectures, we'll have many demonstrations and graphic animations to tie the science of physiology to your physical body. You'll be using both physical and visual memory to learn the lessons. I'll close the series with a number of exciting workouts that will frequently refer back to the anatomy and physiology learnt along the way. We created a special studio just for these workouts. Let's take a look at it right now so you can see what I'm talking about. Here we are, and the first thing you should know is that we didn't build this studio just for my health. I expect you to do the workouts with me. Now, you can intensify the workouts by adding more weight, more repetitions, more sets, and I'll remind you of that as we go along, or perhaps by combining the workouts as you become fitter. As you can see, I have two volunteers in each workout with me, so you'll be able to see real people doing real exercise, learning the routines for the first time in real time. Now, if they can do it, I'm pretty sure so can you. Now, my volunteers range from their early 20s to nearly 60, and all of them try to work out regularly, but they all have different strengths and weaknesses. Some had perhaps developed routines which made them very muscular, but not so flexible, or, or vice versa. And as you'll learn in the lectures, you need to work your whole body in a variety of different ways to manage life's demands, from having to reach for a jar on a high shelf, uh, which requires balance and mobility, to preventing injuries, which requires strength and flexibility. Now, we'll use some very simple tools, uh, all sorts of equipment, some weights, uh, some resistance bands, uh, a training bar, a weighted bar that we have here, benches, steps, medicine balls, all that kind of stuff. And I'll also point out uh, simple substitutions you can use. So a lot of this kit uh, designed for home exercise, available from most sports retailers, but we can actually substitute with some other stuff along the way. And I'll give you tips on that uh, as we go along. So really, you don't need fancy equipment. All you need is the will to do it. Now, I'll lead each workout and I'll use our two volunteers to point out things along the way, particularly good form. I want to make sure that you're doing it right and make sure that you know which parts of your body are working on each movement. So, for instance, uh, when we're doing our little squats here, I'll make sure that you're bending the knees in the right direction because it's a hinge joint. I'll make sure you're pushing into the heels so you're really feeling it in the right place, getting into the legs, getting into the buttocks there. And I'll be pointing out, for instance, in the lunge, making sure you get on the ball of the foot at the back so that that makes sure you're not twisting the knee, the knee bends in the way it's meant to, so you'll get that strength development, you'll get that toning effect without the risk of injury. So this really is uh, a truly unique uh, mind and body learning experience. Uh, not only will it put sweat on your brow, but it'll put a smile on your face. He says looking around for some smiles. So let's go back to the lecture studio so we can start to understand what fitness really is and what it means to us. All right then. Now you understand that this is an interactive course with demonstrations designed to help you understand both anatomy and physiology principles. So be prepared to participate. Trust me, you'll learn more and feel better if you do. So first off, let's clarify the difference between physiology and anatomy. So take a deep breath and stand up. Straighten yourself up. Yeah? If you can't stand up comfortably, just sit up straight in your seat. OK, are you up? Now, what just happened? You activated around 302 muscles to stand up. The 26 bones in your spinal column shifted to lift your head and align your neck with the rest of your back. Multiple other systems engaged to enable you to move at all. 
On the simplest level, anatomy refers to these bones and muscles, to all the parts of the body. Of the body. Physiology, on the other hand, refers to the interaction of these bones and muscles, along with the nerves, tendons, veins, arteries, heart, lungs, and thousands of complex systems working together to enable you to stand, move, and live. So physiology explores how your body functions. You can't understand physiology without knowing something about anatomy and vice versa. So go ahead, sit yourself back down, let's get comfortable. So how easy was it for you to stand or sit? Did you have to push yourself up with your hands? Did your knees hurt as you move? Or did you kind of spring up and bounce down? Each of you will have a different answer. Fitness then is clearly a subjective state with being fit related specifically to your personal medical history, current health status, socioeconomic situation and perhaps sporting aspirations. In addition, fitness could be considered an emotional, mental and I guess even spiritual dimensions. There's no doubt all of these are interrelated. Uh, but for now, let's think about fitness in physiological terms uh, and break it down into two strata. Health related components and skill related components. Health related components of fitness are defined as having the potential to impact upon our quality of life. So let's list these and I'll define them briefly for you. Cardiovascular endurance is the capability of your heart and lungs and circulatory system to take in, absorb and use oxygen. Next we have muscular endurance. And this is the capacity of a muscle or perhaps a group of muscles working together to maintain continued contractions against a low or moderate resistance. Now that's different from strength, which is the force effectiveness of a muscle or a group of muscles. Flexibility is the mobility of the joints and their associated soft tissue structures. And then body composition. Now, this is the proportional segmentation of your body weight into lean and fat constituents. Now, skill related fitness components, on the other hand, um, are desirable for many sporting activities, but a deficiency in these will not negatively impact upon your health, um, uh, as with those we've just described. So let's have a look at these. Firstly, agility, which is the ability to change direction of the body or parts of the body, incorporating elements of deceleration, acceleration. Balance is the ability to maintain both static and dynamic equilibrium of the body parts as well as the whole. Coordination is the ability to perform a range of simple to complex movements with precision, with timing, with continuity. And so um, let's try that now. I did tell you this was going to be interactive. So this is what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, place your hands in front, palms down. You can do this sitting down. You don't have to go anywhere to do this. And your right hand, I'm going to mirror this for you. So your right hand is this one. I'd like you to move up and down, please. Nice and easy. Straight up straight down. I'm taking it you've got that bit, so hold it there. We're now going to take your left hand and you're going to describe a square. It's going to go up and across and down and across. Yeah, up and across and down. So we've got our square. So what is our right hand doing? It's going up and down and up. I hope you're still with me. The left hand is going up and across. And in case you've not guessed what's coming next, can we do both together? That is the trick. You have no idea how hard I'm concentrating now. So a little exercise you can practice there. And actually, beyond that, there is a possibility that you might be able to do one hand and then do the other. I don't know. Anyway, who knows? Did that work? Let's move on. Skill related fitness. Another component is power, which is the ability to achieve optimal force development of the voluntary muscles, but in a minimal time period. Reaction speed is the ability to recruit selected neuromuscular responses with a minimal time delay. So taking into account uh, the many influences on total fitness, therefore, it's easy to see why there are so many different ways of exercising, as a program designed to improve one of these components will not satisfy the others. Let's concentrate on the first group, the health-related fitness co components, as these are clearly of greater significance to most of us. So let's now look at each of these in a little more detail. Cardiovascular endurance is also referred to as uh, cardiorespiratory fitness, CV, cardio, stamina, uh, aerobic fitness, but all of these have the same definition. Cardiovascular endurance is the body's ability 
to intake oxygen, transport it through the blood, and then use it in the exercising muscles. Naturally, this ability is improved through specific activity, usually involving a number of large muscle groups and sustained for a certain length of time. Uh, prime examples being aerobics, uh, jogging, cycling. Now, the American College of Sports Medicine recommends uh, around 30 minutes at medium intensity on five days per week or 20 minutes at high intensity on three days per week. Now, whilst these are minimum thresholds for maintaining health and reducing risk of disease, greater gains and specific goals such as weight loss will be achieved with 60 minutes, although this can be achieved piecemeal fashion. As I mentioned earlier, even 15 minutes will do a lot of good so you can build up time as your body strengthens. So, how really does exercise lead to positive change? To begin answering that question, let's look at the anatomy involved. It all starts in the lungs. The inspiration of oxygen is the beginning of the process. And in response to the increased demands of exercise, the lungs, they don't actually become larger. Instead, the body learns to absorb more of the oxygen so that more can be taken in with each breath. Over a period of time, the diaphragm, the intercostal muscles, and the pectoralis minor that control respiration all become more efficient and able to work for longer at higher intensities. Oxygen is then transported in the blood. A key response to exercise is that there is an increase in both the total blood volume and the concentration of red cells, which are the carriers. In time, your body grows more capillaries to deliver more oxygen faster and more efficiently. The blood takes the oxygen to the heart by the pulmonary veins from where it's pumped around the whole body. Working out leads to the heart being able to hold more blood. The wall of the heart becomes stronger, so an increased amount of blood is ejected with each beat. The body is then able to accommodate higher intensities of exercise. A byproduct is that the stronger heart will be able to work less hard when resting, so your resting pulse will drop. Within the muscle cells, we have mitochondria that break down food for fuel, and these use the oxygen delivered by the blood to go about their work. As a response to exercise, the number and the size of these mitochondria increase, so the muscles are able to use more oxygen and so sustain greater effort for longer periods of time. Exercise also causes a change in the way fats are transported in the blood by increasing the ratio of high-density lipoproteins to low-density, the latter being associated with the accumulation of uh, fatty deposits on the walls of the blood vessels, which uh, uh, leads to the condition atherosclerosis. In other words, exercise helps to reduce low-density lipoproteins, also called the bad cholesterol, while increasing the amount of good cholesterol, or HDL. It's no surprise, then, that research reveals a simple shift from low cardiovascular fitness to moderate can reduce death due to cardiovascular disease by as much as, get ready for this, 66% in men and 50% in women. So finally, let's consider the ideal exercise format to improve your cardiovascular fitness. Firstly, and this is a common thread uh, you'll notice coming up in this series, warm-up. We always begin with a warm-up using gentle, flowing movements of the major limbs, uh, beginning small and gradually increasing in amplitude and effort, working through all the joints. The workout phase, featuring continuous rhythmic movement that maintains an intensity of anywhere between 55 and 90% of your maximum heart rate, which in the most basic form we calculate by subtracting your age from the number 220. And you'll be doing that for between 20 to 60 minutes, dependent upon your current fitness level. And then, no surprise, we have a cool down at the end by incrementally lowering the intensity as a sudden stop may cause fainting due to the blood pooling in your muscles and reducing the amount of oxygen getting to your brain. And this can then be followed by some static stretching for uh, the major muscle groups. Within this series, there's a whole lecture dedicated to the cardiovascular system, so we can examine these items uh, just mentioned in a little bit more detail then. We can investigate the next two health-related fitness components together, as muscular endurance and strength uh, can really be viewed as, let's say, two sides of the same coin. They're different, uh, but functionally complement each other. 
Healthy muscles are fundamental to quality of life, enabling us to explore different forms of play as a child, to work as at a manual job as an adult, and uh, to carry your offspring uh, uh, as, a, as a parent. Later life, maintaining your independence. While ceaseless endurance and Herculean strength may be the stuff of sporting legend, the basic functional ability to stand up from a chair unaided is perhaps the best way to put into perspective the importance of muscle health. Taking care of your muscles can ensure you are able to execute daily activities and you can be physically active, whatever your age. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommend twice weekly strength endurance training. And you'll be encouraged to know that studies have shown that older adults get the same benefits from exercise uh, uh, strength training as those who are middle-aged or younger. To try to understand how, uh, how strength training uh, in terms of strength and endurance relate to each other, let's refer to the Oxford Dictionary of Sports Science and Medicine. And, and what this says is that we look at a continuum that ranges from strength at one end to endurance at the other end. So um, absolute strength is something we quantify in terms of what's called the one repetition max. And that's the, uh, the greatest amount of weight you can lift just once with correct technique. At the endurance end, the number of repetitions increases and the load decreases. Uh, in everyday terms, moving a sofa uh, will fall to the left end um, of the line, whereas sweeping the drive will perhaps uh, uh, be on the right. Now, this is very useful then, as it enables us to prescribe the correct exercise program to, to achieve desired outcomes. But first, let's uncover just how the body adapts to these two different challenges. Muscular endurance is the repeated and sustained contractions of the target muscle or group of muscles against a less than maximal resistance. It's fueled by what's known as the lactate system, and we'll look at this in greater detail in the lecture covering the body's energy systems. To cut a long story short, one of the drawbacks with this route to supplying energy is the gradual buildup of lactic acid in the muscle. Now, this buildup alters the pH and creates an environment that impedes the continued contraction of the muscle cells. To prevent this, with regular exercise, your body improves the supply of oxygen by increasing the number of blood capillaries in and around the muscle, so you're able to perform longer before lactic acid takes hold. Muscular strength training, on the other hand, leads to microscopic tears to the tissues at cellular level. Ingesting sufficient protein and resting will encourage the adaptive process known as supercompensation. Now, supercompensation lays down extra contractile protein in the recovering muscles, and this in turn leads to an increase in the cross-sectional muscle size and a corresponding increase in strength. The degree to which muscles grow is dependent upon testosterone levels and explains the different responses between men and women with this type of training. As you've probably observed, men who lift weights generally increase muscle size, but women improve their tone and appear uh, leaner. And this is addressed in much more detail in our lecture on uh, muscles, so look out for that. In terms of health um, and health improvement, muscular endurance and strength training has been proven to increase bone density now, that's going to reduce the risk of osteoporosis. It'll also increase metabolic rate, so assisting in weight management, reduce blood pressure, decrease low-density lipoprotein and raise high-density lipoprotein. All good things. They also improve posture and thereby reduce the risk of lower back malady and the risk of injury from events such as falls. So that's uh, quite a, a wish list, I'm sure you'll agree. What we now need to consider is how to put this info into practice. So uh, how do we devise exercise guidelines that will lead to improved strength uh, and or endurance? So, no surprise, uh, we warm up first of all. And the best way to do that is by performing basic resistance training movements, but with no resistance, uh, just to work through a smaller range of movement. You ideally want a minimum frequency of two times per week. Um, and we're looking at one to three sets of somewhere between five uh, strength and 25 endurance repetitions. And the resistance may be somewhere from 50% to 90% of your one repetition max. So that's going to depend on your goals. We're moving the weights at slow to moderate speed. We're resting for somewhere between 30 to 60 seconds between sets. And again, that's dependent slightly upon your goals. And allowing 30 to 45 minutes for each session. 
As always, we'll cool down at the end with some stretches for the muscle groups worked in this session. The concepts of uh, strength and endurance, together with specifics about weight training the body's adaptive responses, will be addressed in that lecture on muscles, as I mentioned earlier. So far, we've covered the parameters of cardiovascular and muscular fitness. Our next parameter is flexibility or, or suppleness, a function we often only become aware of when we lose it following perhaps a specific injury or as we get older, although sports disciples will almost certainly notice uh, when a lack of it affects their game day performance. Flexibility may be the most undervalued of components uh, of fitness, even though absence of it can affect health status in a number of ways. Uh, for example, tightness in the hip flexors can actually pull on the lower part of the pelvis and it causes it to tilt. To counter this, the lower spine assumes an exaggerated curve um, or a lordotic position. And over time, this can cause uneven pressure on the intervertebral discs in the lumbar region and can lead to a number of health issues, most notably sciatica. As I mentioned earlier, uh, flexibility describes the range of movement that is possible about a joint or perhaps a number of joints. It's highly site specific. So a flexible upper body may not necessarily be connected to a flexible lower half. In addition, flexibility is divided into static and dynamic classifications. And again, a good score in one doesn't necessarily imply the same in the other. Static flexibility involves slowly lengthening a muscle, either by natural movement or by adding external pressure uh, at the end point and then holding this position. For example, a shoulder stretch. To stretch my shoulder here, I'll bring my arm across the chest I'll take a hold above the elbow and I'll squeeze it in and that's giving me a stretch above the shoulder and I'm just going to hold that there. And we'll ease back out of it. So the muscle slowly lengthens there. Dynamic flexibility, however, refers to the range that can be achieved through movement. The muscle being continuously lengthened and shortened, but not being held at an end point. Movement must be controlled, though, because there's danger that this can become what's known as a ballistic stretch. And this carries an injury risk if it causes an overstretching of the muscle's capability. As an example, and you can join me with this again, this is a dynamic stretch for the chest. So by simply opening the arms, and I'm not doing too much because I don't want to tear my jacket, but if you get that little swing of the arms opening, what's happening is that's beginning to stretch the pectoral muscles, but it's under control, but it's not ballistic. Now, anyone who's joined a, a group exercise class, particularly a mind-body style class, such as yoga or, or Pilates, will be acutely aware that we all have differing levels of flexibility. But what causes this variance? Um, actually, there, there, are, there are a number of factors. Firstly, gender differences. Um, sweeping generalizations, uh, but it appears that females are more flexible than males. A Harvard University study examined the lower back area specifically and concluded that the, uh, the extra flexibility was necessary to accommodate the shifting center of gravity during pregnancy. Next, although appropriate training can improve flexibility at any age, the rate of improvement is greater at a younger age. This is primarily due to the collagen in the connective tissue becoming more dense as we age. Uh, but also a reduction in cell activity within the cartilage, uh, the ligaments and the tendons. There's also a clear link between levels of physical activity and flexibility. Something as simple as regular walking, for instance, has been proven to have a positive influence on mobility within the hips and spine. And believe it or not, the time of day can actually affect your level of flexibility due to our uh, circadian rhythms um, uh, affecting body temperature and hormonal activity. Now, improvements in your flexibility are achieved through what's referred to as a developmental stretch, a static stretch that's carefully applied and aims to lengthen the elastic muscle beyond its original length. The result is that each muscle cell that normally contains protein filaments that are overlapped begins to elongate. In addition to this, the collagen fibers within the connective tissue that surrounds the muscle start to align themselves with this direction of tension. This latter point explains why rehabilitation from muscle injury always involves stretching as the scar tissue that forms is made up primarily of collagen fibers. The American College of Sports Medicine recommends including flexibility training three times per week. Now, a later lecture we have will focus entirely on the topic of stretching together with reviewing the various techniques and the body's responses to them. 
The final health-related fitness component is body composition. This element is more important uh, a measure than weight alone as it allows us to assess the percentage of our body weight that is attributed to fat. Now this is a valuable statistic since the medical fraternity universally agrees that excess body fat can lead to increased risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, joint problems, respiratory issues and high blood pressure. Differences in body composition explain why two women or two men may be of similar weight but have totally different shapes. The tricky part to get your head around is that lean body weight, I'm talking about muscles and bones, are more dense than fat. So you could be looking at someone who's in great shape but actually weighs way more than the cuddly friend standing next to them. This principle also explains why it's possible that uh, you commit yourself to an exercise regime, you burn fat, you look and feel great, but you're not losing any weight. In fact, you might gain weight. But if it's not body fat, if it's instead muscle, if it's healthy weight, then that can't be a bad thing. It starts to get you thinking about why so many of us have become obsessed with our weight, doesn't it? It is such a complex puzzle that later in the series, we'll take time to look at this issue specifically. So what are the recommendations uh, for percentage of body fat? The National Institutes of Health uh, target guidelines are 20 to 21% for women, uh, with 30% or more being classed as obese. The healthy ranges for men are between 13 and 17%, with 25% or more uh, being considered obese. The difference between the sexes, in, in case you're wondering, uh, really relates to childbearing. The percentage of fat on a woman ensures that adequate fuel is always available um, and affords uh, a degree of insulation and protection. And we'll look at ways to measure body composition in my next lecture. As you can see, we need a certain degree of body fat, known as uh, essential fat, uh, found in the bone marrow and the organs. But it's the additional fat that we store beneath the skin, called subcutaneous fat, that presents a risk factor. Another factor that influences the degree of risk is the distribution of fat, with abdominal accumulation, i.e. Uh, what we call an apple shape, being considered more dangerous than fat around the hips and thighs, which, uh, interestingly, we refer to as a, a pear shape. Worth bearing in mind, also, is the results of a study published in the International Journal of Obesity that showed that yo-yo dieting can lead to fat being stored in the tummy area rather than elsewhere. In a later lecture, uh, we'll arm you with the knowledge to be a winner at losing weight if that's your goal. Improving your body composition is ideally achieved via a two-pronged attack. First, reduce calorie intake to create a negative energy balance so that fat stores are used as fuel. And then secondly, increase lean body mass. The first of these is achieved via suitable cardio exercise and the latter through muscular endurance and strength training. As you'll remember from earlier, these two interventions also bring about other health benefits. So there you have it. The components of fitness lay bare, although this is not where the story ends. Because history has taught us that as a society becomes more prosperous, our population fitness levels have tended to drop. So in our next lecture, we'll take a look at how to measure these various factors um, that are clearly affecting our, our well-being. In addition, as alluded to earlier, we'll take each of them out and we'll unwrap the onion and learn a little more about our bodies and how our bodies work and crucially, how we can use this information to help us to achieve our goals and ensure that the marvellous machine that is our body functions optimally at work, at rest and at play.